Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with a friend, uh, Robert Green, and author of, uh, of many, many books. Robert, welcome to the podcast. So, Robert, uh, the last time we'd spoken, you'd just come off writing Mastery. And now you've written a book about human nature. Why this book? Out of all the books you, you could have written, how does this book fit into your, your collection of books? And why this one? Why now? Well, it's kind of the culmination of all of my years of study and research and writing and and consulting work that I've done. You know, that's over 20 years of of experience. And, you know, a lot of people have come to me with their problems in in dealing with office-type situations or political problems. And then all of the consulting I've done with kind of high-powered people, I began to see a pattern, which is namely that people, The people I was dealing with were really, really bad at judging the character of the people they were dealing with. Some people were better than others. I don't mean to generalize, but mostly they were not, that was their weak point. They they were great technically. They, they They could do code. They knew their business very well or whatever it was. But when it came to hiring an associate or finding a business partner or finding an intimate partner or dealing with the politics of any kind of court-like environment. They were at sea. And I began to realize that, you know, nobody really teaches or writes books that help you kind of pierce, penetrate behind people's masks. Because in, in society, we all wear a mask. We don't really show who we are. We don't directly express our emotions we struggle to present the most pleasant, politically correct, most wonderful face towards the world. But behind that screen, all kinds of weird things are going on. So I wanted to write a book that was kind of like a code book for deciphering human behavior based on all of my experience, based on an incredible amount of research, based on these timeless laws of human nature that govern human behavior going back thousands, hundreds of thousands of years in some cases. And the reason I thought it was very important for it now is that we've actually gotten worse. As we've gotten more technologically brilliant, we've gotten more socially awkward and socially, I hate to use the word ignorant, but not so enlightened. We spend so much time in our virtual worlds. You go out to a restaurant, you see people hardly talking, just sort of submerged in their smartphones. So people are not as attuned, they're not as sensitive, they're not as empathetic as they used to be, which is a major point in my book. So I was worried and concerned that this is a problem that could get worse. And I wanted to write a book, because I think there's a real urgency right now to kind of combat this kind of self-absorption plague that is occurring. So I want to get into the book, but before that, I want to zoom out and say, um, just sort of ask you, what do you think your your superpower is in terms of why, uh, you know, all these, as we talked about before, all these, you know, high power people come to you um, and ask for your advice. Is it that you are better at observing than others? Is it pattern recognition? Is it that you're not afraid to say what you think? Is it all the above? Like, what do you think your superpower is that maybe others are are, are blocked at in this dimension? Well, it's, it is a combination of all the above. Obviously, The 48 Laws of Power was my first book. It was highly successful, and based on that, people came to me. But I wrote that book basically because I was, my whole life, I've been very, very observant. I think any writer, particularly a fiction, although I write nonfiction, has to be extremely observant of other people, very sensitive to their moods and emotions, I maintain in the book that it's not a completely intellectual process, that we have sensitivities to people that are, that are nonverbal. It's something I've been practicing my whole life. I think it's a kind of a muscle I've developed. I mean, we could go into the psychology of why I developed that, but I don't think, I think that'd be kind of boring. But I've been working on it for a long time. And then 
with, with the success of my book, and I did the consulting work, and I've dealt with people, and I've talked with people, I've gained a lot of experience, a lot of firsthand knowledge, a lot of repetition when it comes to helping people and seeing patterns in their pro- in their problems. Yes, a lot of it is patterns. Uh, one of the most obvious ones that I noticed was that people, particularly powerful people, would tend to fall for charmers. People who could talk a good talk would come into a meeting with a good resume, come from a fancy school, and they would talk their way into a job or into a partnership, and they had very low, bad character. And so I had I wrote a whole chapter of that in my new book. That was one of the patterns I had noticed, that we're not good, most of us aren't good, at looking behind people's charming appearances and actually assessing, weighing their character. So it was a combination of everything you said, my kind of sensitivity, years of experience, and noticing all kinds of patterns in the problems people were presenting me. How do we d- uh, determine the difference between a charmer with character and a, uh, with real character and a charmer who's sort of full of it? Well, most times charmers are kind of full of it because charm is a compensation often for a lack of real skill, you know, but there are exceptions. There are people who are very charming who can be skillful. So we can't completely generalize there. But the main thing I say in that chapter is you're looking for patterns of behavior. People reveal themselves not through their words, not through an interview, but through their past, through their patterns of behavior. So you have to do your research. You have to look at, you know, their checkered career before behind them. If they haven't been able to sustain a job for several years, more than a couple years, there's something going on. If they've had a lot of kind of rifts with people, you they'll tell you, oh, it was the other person's fault. You know, I'm an angel, blah, blah, blah. But at some point, you have to sort of not judge people by their words, but by their actions, by what you can read in their background. If they have no background to read and you can't do your research, I would be very wary of the charming personality. The other thing is nonverbal behavior. People who are charming, they, they talk a, a really good talk, but you could sense, and I, and I have a whole chapter on this, when people are not telling the truth, when they are exaggerating, when they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes, there's certain obvious clues. Um, and I go through that, in, as I said, in the nonverbal chapter. You know, it's, not, it's never impossible to be able to gauge that, but you want people of high character. And what that means are people who can learn from their mistakes. So a charmer, if you have a meeting with them or an interview, and you kind of make a critical comment or a comment about maybe something that they didn't do right or said that it was perhaps wrong or something in their past, they will tend to get very defensive. You want people who are open to learning, who are open to criticism, who have dealt with adversity, who've come through, who have shown that they can handle stress and pressure, and who can work with a team. You need to gauge that before you hire people. You can't have perfect knowledge or people are never transparent. But the more research you do, the more you actually see what's, you know, their true weight, their true worth, as opposed to the front they present, the the less likely you are to make some kind of terrible mistake. You know, you, you start the book with, uh, you know, the first chapter is master your emotional self. And, and one thing I'm curious here, uh, you know, you, you write about in the book, but I want you to expand a bit here is, you know, what enables some people to reframe tragedy as, as, as a growth area element or, or something they needed to go through or something that was good for them in the, in the long run versus other people who are mired in, in tragedy and let it define their lives? Well, you know, it's hard to say whether it's something that's an inner quality that's just nature, you know, just how people are born and how they're wired or whether it's a quality they acquire. But some people have a desperate, desperate fear of failure. And that's because their ego is so connected to their success. So if anybody criticizes them or if their startup fails, they don't have the distance from themselves to say, well, here's what I did wrong. Let me try again. Instead, Their whole sense of self-worth is wrapped up in their success of what they do and how people respond to them and the attention they get. So a lot of it has to do with ego. 
Now, of course, the very successful people have ego, and I'm not saying it's a, you don't have it. I mean, Steve Jobs had a huge ego. I have an ego. But it's the degree to which you can, at, at moments, detach yourself and look at yourself objectively and understand that any entrepreneur is going to fail, is going to have adversity, is going to have setbacks, and that's actually a good thing. That's how you learn. That's how you make yourself better. And the only way you can do that is you have some distance. You don't take failure as a sign that you are a bad and worthless person, and then because of that, get all fearful and afraid to t do something else or have other kind of compensations that are unhealthy. I talked in Mastery about one of the greatest entrepreneurs who ever lived, who was Ford, the, the, the founder of Ford Motor Company. He said, you know, failure was my school. He failed three or four times in establishing his automobile company in the 1890s at a time when it was very difficult to start up such a company. Failing once was usually the sign that you were doomed because it required so much capital to start up. And he just kept going and going and going. And he said, each time I failed, I learned what went wrong and I was able to apply the lesson. That's the story of all the greatest inventors from Edison to Ford is how you handle failure and the ability to separate your ego from what you're actually doing. And your whole chapter on the on the fragile ego, but what sort of a punchline of how to determine the uh, the difference between, or you know, how to separate sort of the the ego that is life serving versus versus that that isn't, or, or another way of using this, and you talk about this in the book, is uh, how to separate sort of a healthy self love versus narcissism. Well, you know, I I have a chapter called transforming self love into empathy. And the point of that chapter is normally it's, it's very human to always think that the other person is the one who has the bad quality in human nature. It's always others who are narcissistic, aggressive, or passive aggressive, or envious, etc. And one of my points in my book is to stop that kind of self-deception. We are all cut from the same cloth. If some people are narcissists, that means all humans have narcissistic tendencies, and I try and show how we are all, to some degree, more or less, self-absorbed, myself included. But it's only a matter of degree. So we all know in life, there are moments when we can feel very attuned to other people, very observant, and very aware of what's happening around us. And those are moments when we generally feel pretty good about ourselves and can get out of our self-absorption and actually look at the people we're dealing with. But if we get depressed, if we have a series of failures or setbacks, we all tend to become more self-absorbed. And the deeper that self-absorption goes, the harder it is to get out of ourselves and actually pay attention to the people around us. I call them deep narcissists. These are people whose narcissism is much stronger than others. They don't have the capacity to ever rise above that self-absorption level and actually get out of themselves. Everything that people say or do, they reflect as a reflection of them. It all has to do with what about their personality and what you're saying. They take everything personally. And so those kinds of people find it much more difficult to rise to that moment where they can get outside of themselves. So I'm saying the deep narcissist has the pro is not able to love themselves which is why they're always straining for attention from others. We learn very early on to derive our sense of self-worth from ourselves and not have to get it always from other people, from mommy and daddy or from friends and colleagues. When we're depressed, we can calm ourselves down and say, well, actually, I'm a pretty good person. I'm really not that bad. I'm just going through a rough patch. Deep narcissists don't have that self-love. They, so they need they can only get their attention and recognition from other people, their sense of self-worth, which makes them constantly acting out. So self-love is actually very important quality to have, because if you don't have it, then you're never able to kind of get outside of yourself because you're always struggling to get validation from other people. That, and then from there, However, you need to build empathy. You need to develop that muscle that I mentioned earlier, where you, you're able not only to get outside of yourself upon occasions when you're feeling good, but all of the time and 
put yourself in the position and the perspective of other people. It's the most critical life skill you can ever develop because we're social animals. We're political creatures. You can't get very far in life if you're so wrapped up in yourself and you continually misjudge people. So developing the skill to get inside the mind frame, the perspective, the worldview, the values of the people around you is absolutely critical. And so in that chapter, I show how to take that sense of self-love and self-worth that you develop as a child, hopefully, and how to transform that slowly into empathy. And for people who don't have internal self-love and are self-aware of that, is that something they can build up via, via habits? I mean, you know, gratitude journal, therapy, meditation, or what, what's, your, what's your advice for them? Well, it's very difficult. It depends on the depth of the narcissism. Um, I maintain that there are two ways out of our self-absorption. One is to get involved with people and force yourself to continually cut off that internal monologue and struggle to get inside their, their viewpoint. And I give you a whole bunch of tips on how to practically achieve that. The second way is through your work. A lot of people who are very wrapped up in themselves and narcissistic find tremendous relief from their work. They get outside of themselves by putting it into a business, into a work of art, into just something they build and make. And that has been the redemption for a lot of people who, who are deep narcissists. You have to choose one of those two paths. The problem with narcissism is you're not aware of the problem. So becoming aware, you know, in writing the chapter, I had a bit of an epiphany myself, which was me, Robert, I'm actually quite a narcissist. I'm quite self-absorbed at, at particular moments, but even in general, I am. And that was quite a wake-up call. So with that awareness, I'm now able to catch myself in various moments and see that, that narcissism, that ego in myself constantly flaring up. So you have to first become aware that you have this problem and catch yourself before you can redeem yourself. Therapy is a great way, just trying to get outside of yourself and forcing yourself how to develop better social skills, which I talk about in the book, putting your energy into your work. These are all ways that you can kind of get outside of yourself. You talk about seeing through people's masks. I want to talk about evaluating people. What, what are uh, other common misconceptions? You mentioned charmers, others that, uh, patterns that you see people fall for. Well, the, the thing you want to avoid most all, first of all, this is a book that's trying to be honest, and we all have flaws and we all have problems, and none of us are perfect, and it's not good. We should be tolerant of people and their flaws. But then there are some people who I call toxic, who have such qualities that if, you end, if they enter your life, some of that is envy, some of it is narcissism, some of it is aggression, some of it has to do with a, a very negative attitude towards life. You let them into your world, and they can cause years of damage. And we've all had that happen to us. We get involved in a relationship with a toxic narcissist, and it'll take years of therapy if we, can ever, if we get over this, if we can ever get over it. So I want you to, a main point of my book is to be able to identify these types well before you get enmeshed you know, they get enmeshed in your life. So I said earlier, it's about not taking their appearances for reality. One of the things I discuss in the book, in the, in the chapter on the shadow side of people, the dark side of people, oftentimes when people have a very overt trait, like uh, the tough guy who's so macho, like the saint who's so politically correct and so, you know, doesn't want to hurt anybody and is so moral or the person who's so independent, the rugged entrepreneur, the more overt the person is presenting this particular trait, the more you can be sure that they are disguising the opposite. That that tough guy who's so m macho and needs to push people around is basically hiding deep, deep levels of insecurity. You're not seeing it. You're only seeing the front they present. So you need to judge people by their overt qualities and often recognize that the opposite is what they're disguising. So that, that saintly person could be someone who's very, very passive aggressive. A lot of people who present at the front of being charming and nice and pleasant and pleasing are actually very, very 
passive aggressive because I maintain all humans have aggressive tendencies. We all have ambition. We all have the desire to make our way in the world. People who try to pretend that they're so PC, they don't want to hurt anybody, that they don't have any ambition. They just want to get along. They just want to, you know, make everyone happy are often the most manipulative, passive aggressive people out there. So these are all kinds of qualities that you can gauge by looking at the appearance and judging what's really going on behind the facade. The other thing is be very attuned to people's attitude towards life. And I mention, I give all kinds of examples of types of attitudes. There's on the negative side, there's the hostile attitude, the anxious attitude, the resentful attitude. So somebody, for instance, who's always rebellious and contrarian and doesn't want to do what other people are, are doing has a very kind of hostile attitude towards life. And they'll present themselves as being very funny or very witty or they, they're very keen critics, but they're, they're not good people to get involved with intimately or in a business level because they're going to turn that kind of critical faculty on you someday. So on and on and on. As I said earlier, I'm giving you a code book for how to decipher the behavior that people present to you. I've just given you a few examples. Totally. When you're advising um, people, ambitious people on picking uh, other people to work with, whether you're co-founding a, a business or, or just co- you know evaluating colleagues or people to people to hire, there, there, you, you hear a different sort of uh, conflicting advice out. Some people say you should get people with you know, c- different skill sets. Other people say, you know, double down on your skill sets or, or perhaps more ap- appropriate here, you know, different approaches and more diversity. Other people say, no, no, you want them to think like you. Broadly, what, what sort of frameworks do you advise people think about when thinking about or criteria for people they should work with? Well, I think everything you brought up is legitimate. So I remember when I interviewed Paul Graham for Mastery, Uh, He's since sold Y Combinator, but at the time he hadn't. He admitted to me that his great weakness in life was he's not a good judge of people's character. Not a good, he's not a political person. So he has very cleverly used his wife, Jessica, and a few other people who can cover for that weakness of his, who are much better at doing the kind of work that I'm discussing right now in the laws of human nature. He realized his weakness. You know, you're not just hiring one person. You're not just looking for one partner. You want a team. And so you want some people on your team who will cover your weaknesses. I happen to be extremely inept at digital marketing, at the whole digital world. So I am working with Ryan Holiday, who used to be my protege, who's an absolute genius at it, because I realize what I'm not good at. You have to not fall for the fallacy the kind of Elon Musk fallacy that a lot of entrepreneurs have, that you are great at anything, that anything you touch is gold. You have weaknesses. You have things you're not good at, and you need to hire people to cover those weaknesses. On the other hand, you make a good point. You don't want people who have a completely different value system than you do. Everyone needs to be on the same page. You have a mission statement. This is the spirit of your group. And if you're looking for a business partner, it's like a marriage. And you have to be, you, there has to be a kind of an emotional bond. You have to feel the same way, more or less, about this business. It's not that you're looking for someone who's sycophantic, who agrees with you on everything. Within that framework, there's plenty of room to disagree. But they have the same values. They have the same vision of where the group or the company should go in the future. is very critical. So, you know, you can kind of imbue your entire company with an overall spirit, a kind of a mission, as I say, and this person, this partner that you're working with is on the same page. But the most important thing that you can do in in hiring someone, I said, as I said earlier, is looking at their character. Your tendency will be to be seduced by their glittering resume, by, you know, where they went to Harvard I remember Paul Graham telling me at Y Combinator that kind of the better school you went to was actually an indicator of how poor, how poorly you would be as an entrepreneur. And he generally completely discounted your academic background. And he often the best students at his school were those who had, who went to a community college or went to some 
state university, but they had lots of passion uh, and they had been schooled in life. They knew how to take adversity. So people who've had a silver spoon in their mouth, who've been coddled their whole life, they'll look good to you when you first meet them. But the first sign of stress or adversity, they'll wilt. And you'll realize, oh, I wish I'd seen that I had gauged their character more deeply. So you want people with a solid track record, if you can get them, who have gone through failure and who are tough, who can learn from experience, who have an open mind. These are the qualities that you must ultimately judge people by, not by their charm and not by their resumes. You know, there's this uh, entrepreneur and investor, Keith Raboy, who uh, tells the story of when he was at PayPal, uh, Peter Thiel told him, you know, they were just a small startup at the time. He said that, hey, there's no way we're going to compete with the big incumbents to attract the best talent. So we need to attract uh, best talent that either has been misrated by the market. They're either weird or eccentric or not yet rated, which is often young people. And even you in your you know, history, you, we mentioned Ryan Holiday. You, you, you discovered Ryan Holiday, certainly started working with him at a very uh, young age. What sort of advice do you have for evaluating people who don't have track record? Well, you know, it's more hit and miss. You're going to make mistakes. We, I've made mistakes before. I've hired researchers that were, that were terrible, so I'm not perfect. But just to take Ryan, for instance... I understood right away that he had a very sharp analytical mind. Now, that's not the most important quality that you're looking for, but I needed somebody who could do research, who understood the spirit of my books, and who, who could analyze them. And a lot of people are really have really, really weak analytical skills. I'm not joking. I've encountered this time and again. They're not able to take evidence and examples and sort of abstract a, a real lesson from them, sort of the essence of analysis. They're not good at systematizing. They're not well organized. These are qualities that I think you can determine in a young person. You can test them. You can see, so Ryan, I could tell from very early on, was very resilient. I gave him some criticism for the first works that he did, and he didn't wither and cry and go and, and quit or anything like I've had other people do. So very early on, I hit people with sharp criticism to determine whether they can handle it. You need to be able to do that. I needed to see that Ryan was dependable. He, he would answer my emails right away. He would return my phone calls. This is a very important quality, conscientiousness. When people are late in answering you, when they're late in showing up, They'll come into the office and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, there was traffic was terrible, or my, my dog just died, or whatever. But no, there's, there's always a, it's a sign that they don't care that much. That they're either playing power games or they're very self-absorbed. So you want signs of, that people can, are not self-absorbed, that they're caring about the group and the actual product that they're making, that they're conscientious, that they're detail-oriented, that they can organize material, that they can analyze material, and that they're dependable. Now, you can't get that on a first interview, I understand, but you can get a sense of it from people. I got a sense of it from Ryan, that he was a conscientious, just by the way he looked at me, the way he paid attention, the way he answered my questions, that, sh that he asked questions that shows he was listening to me. These are things you can get from that first interview if you're attentive. But then there are other things that you can get pretty quickly within a month. And then you can always fire people. You give them a, you always give them a, a month or three month training period, a period to assess them. And during that time, you, you test them. You continually test them to see what their true worth is, their true character. Yeah, I like that part about uh, testing them early on. I, we often recommend that people who are co-founder dating, so to speak, do some sort of, you know, all weekend sprint, like go through real duress together to see how, how they, how they'd be able to handle it and go through, you know, simulate sort of things that they would ex only find out perhaps, you know, months or year, even years later. You mentioned envy earlier, and I wanted to explore that with you. You touched on it a bunch in the book. How can people overcome jealousy when it's not, when it doesn't serve them? Uh, of other people's accomplishments or in general, if, if people were to come to you and say, Hey, I want to be more abundance minded, more positive, some uh, more wanting other people to, to flourish, even if it's, you know, if I'm not flourishing in the process, what advice would, would you give them? Envy is an extremely human emotion. 
we all feel it. It comes from the fact that we are continually comparing ourselves to other people. If you were to spend a day and actually literally count the number of times your thought process revolves around what other people have and what they're doing and what you don't have and how you're comparing yourself, you'd be astonished at the very high percentage of thoughts that are absorbed in this comparing of yourself to other people's status. There's nothing wrong about that. It's who we are. It's what's human nature. So I made, I make a difference between benign envy and, and, and aggressive envy or malignant envy. Benign envy is what we feel every day of the week. When I hear of that writer who got a bigger advance than me, who I don't think deserves it, I feel a pang of envy, even though I'm very successful. But I don't act on it. I don't do anything about it. And the next day I realize, God, that's kind of ridiculous. So everyone around you is continually having these kind of envious emotions. But then there's malignant envy that sits inside of you and makes you take some kind of negative action that you regret. So the antidote to envy, there are several antidotes. First of all, if you envy this particular person who's very successful or the, their great relationship they have with their wife or husband, if you got closer to them, if you actually knew them better, you would realize that all that glitters is not gold, that they're not happy, that their relationship isn't as good as it really seems to be. It's, you're just having the illusion because you're looking at them from the distance that they're so great. So get a little bit closer and realize that probably their life isn't so wonderful. So you don't need to feel this, this envy. And I talked in the book about Aristotle Onassis, who was married to Jacqueline Kennedy in the 60s, the wealthiest man in the world by far. And obviously a lot of people envied him for his great wife and for his wealth. He was one of the most miserable, unhappy, depressed people in, in the history of the planet. That's often the case for people who you think have such a great life. The other thing is to stop comparing yourself to people who have more and compare yourself to people who have less. There's always people who are doing more poorly than you, probably the majority of people. They're making less money. They're living in inferior circumstances. They have bad relationships. In looking at people who have less than you, you feel gratitude for what you actually have. And gratitude is the opposite of envy and is the best antidote for any kind of feeling of envy. When people tell you bad news about themselves, we often tend to feel a little pang of joy. It's known as schadenfreude, feeling a little bit of happiness in their pain. It's very human and it's related to envy. Well, you can practice the opposite. When people have good news and something's going on in their life, you can try and feel the joy, their joy, make it your joy to actually feel great for them and to kind of experience their emotion in yourself. And so instead of feeling kind of bitter and resentful, you're actually very happy for them. And you can practice this over and over again. And finally, um, you use envy as a spur to, to excel. If there are people that you envy who have more than you, who have more status or, or money or success or attention, why don't you use that as a spur, as an enticement for improving yourself for making yourself better in your field, for becoming a better writer, a better entrepreneur, for having the success that you envy others having. Instead of turning it into a negative, unproductive emotion, in that way you turn it into something highly productive. I, one thing I want to I would talk about a related topic is identity and reputation. And you talk a little bit about you know impression management and, and it becomes, you know, in a world where identity is becomes more and more important because it's digital and you have, you know, one identity that, that follows you forever. How do you advise people to be thinking about reputation management to the extent that they think about it? That's a chapter I wrote in my very first book, the 48 laws of power. I said, guard your reputation with your life. It's like the most important thing. Your, your name precedes you and your reputation is often what people first know about you and often how they judge you. You want to be able to craft that appearance that the world has of you, what they think of it, think of you. So you want to create a, a consistent reputation. If you are constantly giving signs out that your reputation for doing a good job is actually not that, you know, is invalid 95% of the time, that will completely destroy any of the reputation that you have. If you have a reputation for being very reliable and a good worker, et cetera, 
but you make one mistake or two mistakes in that area, that will destroy your reputation. And obviously in the world of social media, the dangers of stepping into a landmine of, of having a post or a photograph or a thread that will haunt you for the rest of your life and spoil your reputation is extremely dangerous. And it's very difficult when you're young, when you're early 20s, to think of those ways. You just want to kind of be who you are. But realize that you're leaving a footprint, a digital footprint, that's going to be there for a long time. So think twice before you reveal certain sides of yourself that you might later regret. To, to reverse what we talked about earlier, people judge us by our appearances. It's not good. It's not rational. There are problems with that, and we're doing it ourselves, and I'm trying to teach you not to do that. But you have to be aware that other people are judging you by what they see. That's their only criteria. So you have to take control of that, and there's nothing wrong with it. I don't want you to moralize and think, oh, I have to be an authentic, oh, I'm playing a part, oh, I'm just acting. Being a social person is an actor. When you go into your office you don't tell your boss exactly what you think of him or her. You put a smile on your face and you pretend to like them. You're pretending every day of the week you are an actor. You're constantly playing with appearances. So don't be afraid of that. You want to craft the right image, the right kind of reputation for people to see. And if it's wildly inconsistent, if you're constantly doing things that belie that reputation, you're going to cause yourself a lot of trouble. Now, in some, it depends on the work that you're in. If you're a rock musician, that reputation has much greater leeway than if you're a banker. You know, if you're Mick Jagger, your reputation can be you're wild. You have sex with every woman. You take drugs. My God. But if you were Mick Jagger and then suddenly you were seen to be like a Puritan, that you weren't interested in any of those things, that would actually ruin your reputation. So it depends on your field. You have to craft the reputation that fits. If you're in a world like Silicon Valley, where I'm sure people are very, very status conscious, and it's probably quite a PC world, you have to be careful and, and sort of play along with the game and you know have a little bit of distance from yourself as an actor so you don't have to take everything so seriously. But realize the number one law here is people are judging you by their your appearance, by what they can see of you. And you can control that. And if you don't control that, you're going to have a very short life and a very unsuccessful career. And, and part of that sort of ironically is to come off as, as though you're not controlling it, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if you're a poet or a rock musician who's like taking drugs and is out there and it seems like you can't control it, that can seem fine. That can seem authentic. People will like that, or an actor. Sometimes the fact that, you know, a particular actor, a, a Lindsay Lohan or whomever, is out of control up to a certain degree, some people can find that interesting and authentic. But more likely, you're in a profession that's not like that, and there are limits and constraints to what you can show and to the degree of control you must kind of maintain over your image. Totally. You mentioned sort of PC culture, and I wanted to ask her two questions related to that. One is, how do you think about the times and, and how they change? And you, know, you wrote your first book in the 90s, uh, 48 Laws of Power, or 80s? When was the 48 Laws of Power? <laughs> Not the 80s, no. 19, it came out in 1998. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. How do you th think that might have been perceived today? Or, you know, the art of seduction perhaps might have been perceived differently today. I mean, how do you think about the timing of which you, you, you were writing and in which you were living? Well, it's extremely important. I wrote a, one of the longest chapters in my new book about that, about the zeitgeist, about the generation that you're in and how times are always changing. Yep. And if you're a business person or an entrepreneur, you have to have your finger on the pulse of the zeitgeist. You have to anticipate where the world is going to be in three or four years and realize that it's continually changing. I'm aware of that with my writing. So my first book, The 48 Laws of Power, came out in the kind of go-go 90s, the Clinton era. Things were going pretty well. You know, the tech business, there were a lot of, they were heading into a kind of a boom there. You know, things were really happening in hip hop. And so that book really kind of fed into the zeitgeist of the time. 
and rappers really glommed onto it and people in the finance world and politics, it wouldn't be perceived the same way as it is now. I mean, the book sells wonderfully and is very popular still, but I think it wouldn't have had quite the same effect as it came out now. And so the art of seduction may be the same way. So I'm always very acute to what's going on in the world around me. So when I wrote Mastery, my fifth book, the one before this, I sensed that what mattered wasn't so much all the politics and manipulations that I wrote about in the 48 Laws, because I felt that people were actually getting pretty good at that, almost too good. The problem was that people didn't know how to build anything properly. They didn't know the process for creating something lasting and important. They hadn't developed real skills. That was what I was sensing in the year 2011. So I wrote Mastery. The new book, as I said earlier, I sensed this kind of social weakness where people are too self-absorbed and they're not observant of the people around them. So I crafted my book for that. But if I just kept trying to repeat the 48 Laws of Power, I would have been past my prime. The expiration date would have been 2001 on my career. So you have to constantly refurnish yourself. You have to constantly be aware of how the times are changing. So uh, the millennial audience, which I'm very keen towards, I'm always trying to write my books for the people, for my audience, which are generally younger, skew more in their 20s. I have to be attuned to how they're changing and to how they're different. And so this generation, millennial generation, is very different from the one that I came from, not negatively or positively. I make the point in this chapter that every generation tends to judge the previous one negatively. It has been that way for thousands of years. It is not real. It's just simply a perception as you get older that younger people are are wrong or misguided or foolish. It's an illusion because you were seen that way at one point. But understanding how times are changing, how the spirit of a generation, of a younger generation starts to infect the culture at large is extremely important. And it's even more important now than ever because we live in a globalized environment. Yes, there might be all of these anti-globalist things going on in the world with nationalism, etc. But because the world is so interconnected technologically, young people in their 20s are pretty much quite similar to themselves, whether they're in Algeria or Baltimore, as opposed to in the past, where two people from such different cultures, there would be incredible differences now they're incredibly similar. So if you, you need to know the, the zeitgeist because it's a worldwide phenomenon, you need to have your finger on the pulse, not just of what's happening now, but of where things will be in five or 10 years. It's an extremely important skill, and I teach you how to develop that in that chapter. Maybe, maybe in closing, what, with that in mind, what are you sensing now about what could be your, your next book, given where we are in 2019? Well, um, you know, I I recently um, suffered a stroke that was it was a, a nearly a life threatening. I, I I had a near death experience uh, about six months ago, which I'm just emerging from now. I'm going through. Th- I'm going to have a full recovery, but six months later, I'm still walking kind of poorly. I still don't have control over the left side of my body, and it, it was a very very difficult but enlightening experience. It's taught me a lot about things. It's taught me a lot about adversity. And it's taught me a lot about what really matters in life. This next book is going to be inspired by that in some degree. I talked about it in chapter 18 of my new book, when I talk about confronting immortality and the the sense of the sublime in the world. It's a little bit more of, I hate to use the word because people will, will probably be very upset by it, but it's a little more of a spiritual book because I feel like that is kind of what's missing in life. It's nothing to do with God or religion, but I feel the sense of something larger in our lives, something more important than the day-to-day grind, something more important than what we're getting in the media is I think people are really hungering for some kind of something greater than themselves. And so this is a book about how to lift your mind out of the here and now and kind of immerse yourself in something much larger than what you're experiencing, 
so you can kind of elevate yourself and feel reinvigorated about life. It's really about returning to your childhood spirit when you were extremely curious, open, and sensitive to the world. I know that sounds a little bit vague, but believe me, I'm going to make it uh, a very practical, very inspiring book. Um, so that's sort of just to give you an idea. Uh, I'm not sure if you followed this. Is, is Scott Adams, the Dilbert mm-hmm. artist and writer, sort of called basically Donald Trump pretty early just based on his – and he sort of studied his negotiation tactics, persuasion skills, and said, hey, this guy could win and, and will win the presidency – and to the extent in which he was accurate in his uh, assessment of his persuasion abilities, it could have seen someone like you or, or you yourself have, having, having done that, being so observant. Is that, is that something you'd re- resonate with in terms of something that, that you could have done or you saw or that type of uh, assessment of someone's abilities? What, what do you make of that? Well, um, you know, I probably was bad at that. I, I, I didn't think Trump was going to win. I did having lived in New York, I see him as kind of a high level con artist. And I know a lot about con artists because I wrote my first book has a lot to do with con artists. My assessment of him was that, you know, he isn't a great negotiator. He's not good with people. He doesn't have political experience. So I didn't think he would win, but if he did win, he would be in in a whole hell of a lot of trouble. So my way of gauging the future, however, is, is a little bit more macro than that, in that where is the country headed? Now, in 2016, it's, it's a known phenomenon that in politics, people always sort of hunger for the opposite of what they have. So you would know pretty quickly that what would be the opposite of Barack Obama, you couldn't get more opposite than Donald Trump. So you could see that he would have a lot of attraction and a lot of appeal kind of separated from who he was just by being this kind of outside of this reality television star would have a lot of carry a lot of weight. But only in 2016, if he had ran in 20 in 2008, Donald Trump would have had a wouldn't have had a chance in hell. So timing is everything. So where are we headed in 2020 is the question. I'm not going to be the one that's going to say, oh, Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris or Joe Biden is going to, be, is going to win. I'm not Nostradamus like, 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 at, like the Dilbert guy uh, or pretend to be. My thing is more what is the zeitgeist, what is happening in the world. And I maintain that people are going to be, uh, are going to be wanting something kind of very real and substantial. They're not going to be someone want someone who's big with promises, who talks a good talk. They're going to want to see someone a little more down to earth and practical who's going to get things done, who can also inspire. That's a very important quality, but is can be tough to handle the kind of the mess that we're in, but is not another Donald Trump, is not another sweet talker, is not another con artist is not another person who just gives a good speech and then and then goodbye. So I can, based on those numbers and based on the changing demographics, based on patterns of voting, on hard science, on the new young generation of young people who are voting in greater numbers, also based on who's more motivated to vote, I could predict, you know, certain patterns in the future. And when you're looking at business your business and sort of mapping out where things are in three or five years, I want you to look at more of those macro trends of what, how people are going to be reacting differently in three or four or five years. You know, millennials are much more kind of community oriented. They like working in groups. So you have to think of your political movement or your business as tapping into that kind of community spirit that a lot of people in their 20s and early 30s have. So you have to be looking ahead and looking in advance and seeing the bigger picture as opposed to all, you're not going to predict exactly what's going to happen. That's not the art of the skill here. It's more of having a nose for where things might be in five years. That's a uh, a great great note to end on. Uh, The book is The Laws of Human Nature, uh, check it out if you haven't read past books uh, like Mastery and 48 Laws of Power, among others. Definitely check those out too. Robert, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. This has been a great episode. 
and uh, I can't wait for the for the next one. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. I, I really liked it. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst.